Dean. Jim Stark is new to... Which way is it, the uh, University in 10th? It's that way! Played by James Dean, Jim Stark is new to his Los Angeles high school and quickly finds himself in trouble. He embodies basic teenage outrage at the world around him, oh. representing so many teens through the ages. Dad, you told me. You said you, you want me to tell the truth. Now, didn't you say that? This film resonates with surprising relevance even today, though some of the elements are decidedly dated, like the knife fights, chicky runs, and use of terms like dirty tramp. He called me... He called me a dirty tramp! But at its core, this is a movie meant to relate to all young people and the inevitable feelings of isolation they experience. I know one thing. I'm not going back in that zoo. I'm never going back. We're talking about rebellion, and that was a movie that pretty much typified, typified it. Actually, when I'm looking them up, that was number one about re place. teenage Happy rebellion. Oh, but, but, no, so not which way is yet. it to uh, mm. University in 10th? It's that way! Played by James Dean, Jim Stark is new to his Los Angeles high school and quickly finds himself in trouble. He embodies basic teenage outrage at the world around him, representing so many teens through the ages. Dad, you told me. You said you, you want me to tell the truth. Now, didn't you say that? This film resonates with surprising relevance even today, though some of the elements are decidedly dated, like the knife fights, chicky runs, and use of terms like dirty tramp. He called me... He called me a dirty tramp! But at its core, this is a movie meant to relate to all young people. <laughs> You're and getting it twice, is all. <laughs> it's double rebellion this morning. All right. Okay, it should just be blank right now. I don't want the next ones yet. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Okay. Now I forgot. Okay. <laughs> rebellion. You know, that's what that James Dean movie was about. It was about his teenage rebellion. And, you know, if you think about it, we have all get that way sometimes. We don't like being told. How many of you like to be told what to do and kind of forced to do it? All right. I didn't see any hands go up there. And, well, you know, when you think of it, you'll hear some phrases like, I am so sick and tired of living in this little house. You need to make so much more money so we can have a decent place to live. Or he, this one I heard, I'll sneak out and meet you around midnight. My parents are clueless, they'll never know. I didn't do that, but I had kids that told me that and did it. Um, as long as you live under this roof, you'll do what I... There you go. I don't care what you say, you can't make me not go to that party. I saw you checking her out. I was only just looking at her as she walked by. Yeah, you looked at her a really long time. All right, who's going to pray this time? And here's this family together. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the ways you bless my family. So those are opposite spectrums right there, aren't they? When you think about family, when you think about the dynamics of relationships. So we're going to take a poll. All right, so how many of you would like your family to be blessed by God? Okay, pretty good here. Imagine, you know, those of you that didn't raise your hand, does that mean you don't want your family blessed by God? Or are you just too lazy to raise your hands? <laughs> You're in rebellion this morning, right? <laughs> okay, so when we think about it, we all want our families, our relationships with people to be blessed, right? Don't you want to have a good relationship with your family, either extended family, your immediate family, just the whole spectrum of family? Yeah, because, you know, when, but a lot of times when we think of family, blessed isn't what comes to mind the first thing. But it should be. That's what we want it to be. So when we look at so many families today, we, you know, sometimes we'll look at a family and we'll say, ah, God is really blessed. And look at how good they're together. They're always smiling. They're all, they come to church and they all, they got it together, Right. And, you know, we don't know that on the way there, mom and dad were fighting like crazy, and they said, kids, don't you tell anybody we sounded like that. You know, sometimes we put on this show, and we have to make sure that we are total, you know, we don't feel so blessed. We're struggling. It's difficult. Sometimes the finances are tough, and so that makes it hard to feel blessed. You know, we th family's a lot more difficult 
the dynamics of family are way more difficult than we think about, isn't it? You know, when you're first getting married, or when you're first together in your family, maybe even as a little kid, you think everything's easy. You know, you know, mom and dad are together, everything is good. I remember when I was a kid, I remember when my mom and dad used to kiss before dad went out milking, I had no idea about all the undercurrent that was going on. Because to me, everything looked good on the outside. But as we get older and as we see things more clearly, we realize often it's way more difficult than we think. And there are a lot, lot of issues in our lives. You know, way in the 50s and 60s, you know, there was television shows like Father Knows Best. Ready, get some plates. Kathy, you sit there. Bud, pull up a chair. Now, get this one for Mommy. There's nothing like hamburgers for Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh, I'm starving. So am I. You know something? This is the happiest unhappy Thanksgiving I've ever spent. <laughs> I feel I'd like to say thanks in a rather special way. Oh, Lord, we give thee thanks from the depths of our humble hearts for all the blessings thou hast seen fit to bestow upon us. We thank thee for the food which graces our table, the roof which covers our head. We thank thee for the privilege of living as free men in a country which respects our freedom and our personal rights to worship and think and speak as we choose. We thank thee for making us a family, for giving us sincerity and understanding. But most of all, dear Lord, we thank thee for giving us the greatest gift a family may know, the gift of love for one another. Amen. Amen. So yeah, he always got it right. Dad knew best. And then there was Leave it to Beaver and oh, Wyatt, the Beaver. father there. But mainly because we want you to feel that you can come to me or to your mother at any time with any problem and we'll understand. Well, Beaver, it just goes to show you that us grown-ups can make mistakes just like you fellas. But, uh, you know, Wally, shaving is just one of the outward signs of being a man. It's a whole lot more important to try to be a man inside first. See, Beaver, some of the homeliest people in the world have done the greatest things. Well, I'm sure you will see sooner or later, June, but in the meantime, it's practically impossible for parents to make a boy see himself through their eyes. You know something, dear? Beaver's right. We can't ever really protect anyone by hiding the truth from them. You know, Beaver, a teacher once said something to me that I think you'd do well to remember. As you go through life, try to improve yourself, not prove yourself. So think about all, I mean, those are, those are families that some of you grew up with on television. I, I can't say I did, I don't remember any of those. Mine were Brady Bunch. I, mine were the more dysfunctional families. I mean, there was a Partridge family. She was a single mom with five kids. There was Brady Bunch that was blending two families together. And, um, I don't remember any other ones, but those are the two I watched growing up. And so, yeah, between the 50s and 60s and 70s, even our television programming started to change with the family and the relationships and how they were represented. And the traditional family from Father Knows Best, where mom stayed at home and, and always wore a dress, and that always amazed me, and <laughs> always wore a dress, and dad came home from work always wearing a suit and tie, and they just, everything went perfectly, it seemed. Even their problems were just so, just didn't, weren't that big of a deal, it seemed to us today. But to them, I'm sure they were a bigger deal. And then, you know, leave it to Beaver. He was always getting into trouble. I remember watching him, like, in black and white, sometimes, in, you know, on the old reruns. And I thought, but even then, Dad could always smooth it all out and make it work because they could always come home and then, then we get to the, these more, uh, you know, un, un, untraditional families in the 70s. We had one day at a time, and another single family affair. It was a, 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 a uncle raising his, you know, nieces and nephews. And it was just, all of a sudden, the country started switching over, and we had a lot of people raising kids that weren't, as we call them, traditional families. But even those were very 
tame to what we see now in our culture and the things around us. Within our families and our friends' families, there are challenges, and more and more blended families, there are challenges that weren't apparent in the 50s and 60s. There are things that are happening around us that affect our relationships. And, you know, that, and it makes it difficult to, for us to understand how God can be blessing our families. And, you know, when there's exes and, and there's all these different things that makes life so complicated, it's hard for us to see how God can bless our families. Now, as we're going through this teaching over the next few weeks, our series is called Bless This Home. Now, a home can be a single adult, it can be a couple, it can be a whole bunch of other people within that family spectrum. So that's, you're all included, don't matter if you have kids at home, or if you've never had kids, or if you still are going, you know, you're out there, we have a number of single adults, one day they probably are looking, and this is a perfect message for you because you need to get ready for all this, right? All of us older ones can say amen to that. So we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes over the next few weeks and looking at families and family dynamics. And not just mom and dad, it's for each one of us. Each one of us can say something. Because some of you might say, hey, I'm a student, I don't have a family yet. And, you know, but this is the best time to prepare your heart for understanding what that could mean in the future. For our empty nesters and families without children, you know, there's going to be something that will speak to you as well. It isn't just for those that have, that have little ones. Next week, we're going to look at the teaching of Jesus, and blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Most of our homes, 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 homes wouldn't be qualified as being pure. A lot of the things we watch and read and see and hear might not fall into that purity spectrum. All of, of all the sins and temptations and struggles we get into, how do we have homes that are full of people that are pure in heart? And then the next week after that, it will be week three, we're going to study what Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. So many of us have people in our lives and in our families that are peace takers. How can we build a home and a, and a family that are peacemakers? And the fourth week is the best week. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And we're going to see what, a, what difference a Christ-centered family can be to our culture, to our community, to our, to our world, how we can make a difference. And actually, if you aren't being persecuted for your faith, you should be. And we're going to try to help you to find out why you're not and to help you to find, make out the difference. Because if you're not, if there's people that don't see you as different in your faith, you're blending in too much. You're not making much of a difference and an impact with your faith. So we're going to be talking about that because if nobody is persecuting you, it's probably because you're blending in. So today we're going to look at Matthew 5, verse 6. We're just going to look at one verse, and it'll be up on our screen. Matthew 5, 6, six boy, um, says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that, I'm reading the wrong one this morning. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I had the wrong version up here. Everybody repeat that with me. I want you all, we're going to say it out loud. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What will you be? If you're filled, if you are filled, you know, if we go after righteousness, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. And yet, do you fill? Oh, goodness. I, said, I told a couple of people to be praying for me. Please continue to pray for me throughout the message. I'm a little short on sleep, and um, I really don't feel like I practiced. I didn't practice as much as I should have. So... That's why I'm bleh, mumbling today, and I hate that. Um, when we think about hunger, are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Are you filled with God's peace? Are you filled with God's love? Do you 
feel filled with God? Do you feel like your family, your home atmosphere here is filled with God's presence all the time? Okay. I think we're all that way. We're all, we all don't feel it all the time. So as we think about that, what are you hungering for? What, you know, it says if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, what are you hungering for? Over this past week, what are the things that took your time, your passion, your worry, your concern? What are those things that you spent hours on? What were those things that took your attention this past week? You know, often we're filling our time and our hearts and our minds with things that aren't righteous, that aren't holy, that aren't godly. Now, that doesn't mean we only think about God and you all run around there like, what's that word, your head so far in the heaven that you aren't thinking about earth at all? That isn't what this is about. But this is about we need to see everything through the filter of God. So as we work, because most of how many of you work during the week? Have a job of some sort, even chores, and going to school is a job. So if you do any, if you're doing something, if you're alive, you probably are doing something throughout the week. If you're working at home, you're working. So as you're doing those things, are you doing them for God? Are you doing your very best? It says in Colossians, whatever you do, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. So are you doing your job for God? Are you doing your best for God at school, at work? All those things that we do, you know, are we pursuing what God wants us to pursue? Are we, you know, when when we get home and turn on the computer or on the television, Are those things bringing glory to God? Are those things that God will say, Jesus would be glad to sit down with you and enjoy? I mean, it doesn't mean he wouldn't. Hopefully you're watching some good stuff and doing things that he would enjoy. Jesus liked a good time. It wasn't that. He isn't going to tell you, no, it has to be, you know, TBS or whatever that one is. Trinity Bodka, whatever that old one. I don't know if it's even still around. But you don't have to sit there and just watch Christian programming. But you need, we need to be watching things that bring glory to him in a worshipful way. We need to pursue things that are full of integrity, full of, you know, goodness and mercy. You know, Philippians 4, it says, think about these things, those things that are honorable, those things that are lovely, those things that are pure. If we're not, then we're not filling ourselves with righteousness. You know, and if you might want to say, yeah, you know, I actually did pretty good this week. You know, if we would ask your family, ask your friends, what did we see as you doing this week? How did we see your actions and attitudes? Did they reflect Christ? What would they say? So what are you chasing after? What are you pursuing? Are your goals the same as God's goals for you? Have you asked him what his goals are for you? Do you even know what he wants you to be doing? Well, most of it, I mean, a lot of it here in God's word, he tells us how he wants us to live and act and all those kind of things. But then there's a lot of, he gives us a lot of leeway and he, he loves our imaginations. He gives us all these things for us to pursue those paths that would bring him glory. So what is he doing? You know, but you know, a lot of us, we'd like to, We just sit down and say, hey, I just, I need to relax. I'm just going to sit down, put my feet up. And I don't, you know, I don't really care if that's what God wants for me right now. This is what I'm going to do. And that's where we we start falling short of where, because there's nothing wrong with relaxing and enjoying, but we want to enjoy what God puts before us. And we want to want to do it for him. And so, you know, a lot of people, when they look at us from the outside, they'll say, oh, yeah, they've got it all together. You know, you'll come to church. You know, you came to church today. Maybe some of you are thinking, you know, I should, you know, I did pretty good this week. And, you know, I had, you know, nobody knows all of my last week. I'm just going to pretend I, you know, got it all together today. But we might want to, we might come off as the best greeter in, the, in loving on the outside, but inwardly we might just be kind of a jerk. So we need to, to balance our lives 
with what God has called us to be. When you examine yourself honestly and you see these characteristics that, of what you're pursuing, what you're chasing after, you will know, you know if you need to get some image management or if you need, or if you're, you are right on track with God, you know, we're going to screw up. You know, for some of us, it's a craze. Some of us, we like to go off and try these different things and, and these things in the culture, and we go after them, and we end up finding out we're chasing the wrong things. So sometimes it's, you know, we, we start developing an appetite for things that aren't good for us. For me, a lot of times, it's a physical appetite for things that are not good for me. Summer, you know, most people lose weight, and I tend to not do that because I like ice cream. And ice cream is everywhere in the summer, isn't it? I mean, you know, all the Dairy Queens are open, um, you know, on vacation. All the, every little, little burb that we, a little village or borough we went to had a candy shop and an ice cream shop. Well, we didn't go to the candy shops. We've learned better over the years. We don't go there. Because Gary keeps saying, well, we could go to Walmart and get that same candy a lot cheaper. So we don't go to the candy shops. But we do go to the ice cream shops occasionally. I made it to one. We did really good this time. We did make it to McDonald's a couple times for ice cream. But I like the real stuff, the good stuff. So then we go there, and I'm a t I can eat a lot of ice cream. I mean, I, I sadly can. And, but... So that's one of the things, when I went to Costa Rica, I didn't get to have any for, two, for that whole week. And I lost like 10 pounds, <laughs> not just because of that, it was because I got sick when I got home, but it changes your appetite when you go without something for a long time. When you're starting to learn to change your life and your habits, you, your body, you start changing. The same happened, same, a similar thing happened when I became a Christian and, and eventually when I quit drinking. You know, I kept, you know, when I quit drinking, I still went to the same places with my old friends, but it wasn't fun anymore. It wasn't, they really didn't try to force me to change. It's just that it didn't appeal to me anymore. My appetites, my, my habits changed. And you know, so I just didn't go out with those friends much anymore. I'm still friends with a couple of them, but really my life started going a different way, some, a different direction. And that's what happens with our lives when we're starting to pursue God, when we're pursuing righteousness, our life will start going towards Jesus, towards what he wants for us. He wants us to have healthy families. He wants us to have healthy relationships. He wants us to keep our eyes on him and to be a part of a com community. When we start pursuing God and seeking him, suddenly we see the benefits of walking with him. You know, at first it seems really strange to change and you start finding excuses maybe to, oh, I think I'll go back and do that again. But then you feel guilty and nasty. I did that with ice cream for sure. I thought, and then I'd eat a whole bunch and then I thought, oh, this, I'm miserable. I can't do this again. <laughs> and, um, and that's what happens. We do that with our lives. We'll think, oh, I can dabble in that and still follow God. And we start our, our hungering and our, and our appetites change. And then we don't long, for, we long for more of him instead of more of that junk that we were pursuing before. And when we keep, when we hunger for righteousness, we are hungering for God and the direction that he would have us to go. So why doesn't that happen more in our homes? Why doesn't that happen? Why don't more people follow Jesus in, in his righteousness instead of following their own way. Well, there's two things that definitely do not work when we're doing this. One is legalistic Christianity does not work. Secondly, lukewarm Christianity doesn't work. Now, legalistic Christianity and lukewarm Christianity never work. I want to, so what is legalistic Christianity? Anybody want to tell me what that is? Okay, no, I got a couple of no's. <laughs> But that's okay. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm here. Okay, legalistic Christianity is lists. It's a rule book. It's where you say, a Christian looks like this. A Christian does, actually, it's usually the Christian does not do, and then they go one, two, then there's a whole long list. The Pharisees were really good at that. They had like 350 of those do not do's. How would you like that list? 
You know, we have the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, those are good. Those help us in all kinds of life. And Jesus said, and then he, did, he made it down to two. He said, there's really only two commandments you need to follow. Love me with all, of you, all that you got, heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you do those two, everything else falls into play. Legalistic Christianity looks at the rules. And when I first became a Christian, that's what I did. And I, I sadly fear we did that to our kids. First, the first four, anyway. We had this rule book. You have to do this way. You can't do this. You can't do that. And, you know, it's kind of nice for a parent to have a list like that. But we have to do it in love, not just for the sake of the list, not just to look good. When I first became a Christian, I was taught that when I quit, you know, Christians did not go to restaurants that served alcohol. <clears throat> well, in our neighborhood... I wouldn't be going out to eat much, would we, in this area? And I thought, that's ridiculous. The more we started understanding Jesus, where he went and what he did, we realized, that's not what God said. <laughs> that's a man-made rule. And so that's the difference, is the heart behind the rules. And the heart behind the rules, many times, is well-intentioned. But sadly, when it becomes a list, of do's and don'ts, especially teenagers in particular, but I think all of us, we start balking. We start saying, screw this. I can't live up to it anyway, so why bother? That's where legalistic Christianity takes us. And it's never good. It's the rules. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. When you have rules, just for the sake of rules, that's when people rebel. That's when teenagers, you know, it used to be, you know, we tell the kids to do something, they'd say, why? And we would say, because? because. Yep, I heard the one in the back, because he said it a lot. Because I said so. Because he grew up that way. And in the 40s and 50s, that worked. 80s, 90s, 2000s, not so good. You can't just, <laughs> got, mm, no, because I said so isn't a healthy way to respond, but that's the rule thing. That's why we have to keep that in mind. You need to have that relationship because they want to follow the rules because they love you. We follow God's rules because we love him. And his rules aren't burdensome, he said, and they're not. Because when we love Jesus, he says, you'll obey my commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. Because when we love somebody, we want to please them. That's where the relationship comes in. And then secondly, with the lukewarm, Christianity also never works. That's when we believe in God, but we live like he doesn't exist. We say we believe in Christ, but our life has no reflection of that relationship whatsoever, or very little. Lukewarm, how many of you like lukewarm pop besides my husband? There's a couple of us. Or lukewarm coffee. Or there's a few. But most of you, I like my hot food hot and my cold food cold. There's not an in-between hardly on anything. I don't like in-between. I like both sides. I like spicy. I like it pretty hot over there, too. <laughs> And if it's mild, I don't like bland food, period. But, you know, there's, there's those things, those temperatures, those things that we talk about. And that's what lukewarm is. You know, we, there is no such thing as cultural Christianity. You'll hear that during the last election, it came up a few times, progressive Christianity. And there is no biblical preface for pro progressive Christianity. Christianity is what the Bible says. There is no other book. There is no other place to go for your truth. So if it doesn't align with what God says, it's not Christian. And that's something to keep in mind. If we start living like everything is okay, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't go around pointing fingers, but he said, you know, you follow me. He said, follow me. And that's what we're called to do. We're supposed to, our, everything that we do needs to bring glory to God. That's what we were created for. And as we look at our families, as we look at the people around us, you know, there's some indicators in our families. Do we, do we pray together as a family? 
do you pray together as a family? Do you, do you, is it now, is it it's more than just um, God bless this food, amen type thing? Do you really pray together? Do you pray for people? Do you pray for things around you? Do you get together? Do you share with your family? Do you say, hey, I was reading this from God's word. I want to share it with you. Do you serve together as God's family? Do you, do you go and do something together to help somebody else? Those are things that reflect a Christian lifestyle, a Christian family. Now, sometimes, yeah, even if you're a single person, you can be doing that alone, but I would suggest you find a group of other people that do it with you. It's more fun to serve together. I know this summer when we served with the youth group, it was always fun to have, all the, have the kids together and have the men show up and help us and work together. I mean, it's a lot more fun to chop wood with about eight people than it is, or split wood, wasn't it, what we did? And then we had all these, you know, we had about eight of us all together, got it a lot done a lot faster. It was a lot more fun because then you can, I don't know, you can make jokes and do other stuff too. It isn't just the work. It's the, it's the relationships. And we need to do that stuff together. And if you're not doing those things, chances are your family is getting a little lukewarm or a lot lukewarm, if you're not doing any of these things together. And you'll never lead them out of a place that can be harmful. You can, if, if I'm never leading them out of a place that could be harmful to their faith or their relationships, like if you're not, especially the, the parents or the adults in the relationship or the stronger Christian, if you're not leading in that when there's something that does happen, like, oh, we watched a movie the other night that, we turned off because there were so many F-bombs that I couldn't hardly make it. Through. Yeah, I don't think those characters, you would have, they'd done all those beeps like they do in some of those shows. It would have been a lot of noise, but it wouldn't have been a lot of language. And I thought, how can they do that? And that's what it's, it's about, saying, hey, I got to turn that off. Hey, as a family, we can't, we can't do this. As a family, we aren't going there because it isn't the right thing to do. You know, those are the things we need to, to continue to lead our families, especially as a parents, in, in a family relationship in that way. And honestly, legalism and lukewarm Christianity never work. Jesus said in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish you were that one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's a great picture, isn't it? Jesus says, I want you either hot, I want you to be a Christian, I want you to hunger and thirst after me, or I wish you weren't anything, because in the middle, you just make me sick. I'm going to spit you out. Where are you in that spectrum? And those are, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So there's an... A few statements I just want to highlight here as we finish this morning. What does work? As a family, we're not just a Christian family. We are a Christ-centered home. Who is the main, the most important person in your family? Are you, are you building your family on Christ? Now that's for one person or a dozen. How many are with you? Is your home built on Jesus Christ? Unfortunately, where you and I live today, you can call yourself a Christian family and not really know what that means. And not and everybody else doesn't really know what it is. About 70% or so of our country say they're Christians. But they're not Christ-centered homes. Christ is not the center of their homes. I mean, you can say, you can be in the garage and say you're a car. That isn't going to make you a car. That's what Billy Graham used to say. I know it's getting to be an old one, but it really works. <laughs> We're not, we ha just saying you are something doesn't make you are. You can call yourself a duck, but even, and you can even quack and waddle. That still won't make you a duck. So that's what we have to look at. Saying you're a Christian and living in a Christ-centered home and being Christ-filled are different. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christ follower? Scripture doesn't say blessed are those who believe in Christ when it's convenient. But he says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and they will be filled. 
David said it in Psalm 63, 1. He said, you, God, are my God, and I earnestly seek you, and I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You know, we just kind of came out of a drought, I hear, while we were on vacation. How many of you? We had dry, brittle grass at our house before we left. It actually grew this. It's got, well, Gary's got to mow this week. Isn't that amazing how fast grass can just switch over? And that's what David is saying. He said, I was in a dry and parched place. I, but that's how much we need to hunger and thirst for God, just like, like we're thirsting for water. Think about all the silly things you live for in the place of God. Maybe popularity. Maybe money. Maybe it's pleasing the boss. Maybe it's pleasing somebody else. Maybe you're living for your kids. Maybe you're living, I don't know, but maybe you've got somebody else, something else out there besides Jesus. And when you think about all those things that take the place of God, often we think, how stupid is that? I spent all those hours on my computer. I spent all those hours, you know, I mean, not for work, but for, you know, sometimes we waste a lot of time on social media even, Ugh. And, and sadly, sometimes I'm that way. I'll think, oh, I just wasted 10 minutes, and I can't even get that back. And that's, you know, we've got to keep an eye on what we're putting first. So I want to make this as practical as I can. I know we're running late, and I apologize, but how can we get, have a Christ-centered home? First, help your family see God as a loving and approachable and involved in your life. It's very simple. If we want our family to see God is lovable, we've got to live it out. We've got to show him not just the rules, but why, the, why there is rules. Because we all know why parents have rules for their kids, right? We have rules for our kids because we love them. Yeah, we want them to stay safe. We want them to know that, that they have perimeters. That's God's way too. So we want to teach our families that as well. We want to live it out. God is approachable. You can... Come into him, you can sit on his lap and talk to him. That's how I think of him. I can crawl up in his lap and have a conversation. That's how God is. He's like your big, you know, you're, you're just your dad. He wants you to approach the, his, his throne with grace and boldness. Secondly, create an environment where your family can have discussions, your kids, your family can have discussions about God. Not just devotions, but have your table be a friendly place where if there's questions, it's okay. If there's doubts, it's okay. If they have something totally off the wall to say, it's okay. Make it a safe place to have a conversation so that you can talk to them about God. You know, in De Deuteronomy, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Memorize his laws and tell them to your children over and over again. Talk about them all the time, whether you're at home or walking along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning. And do, it, it, that's talking to them all the time about God. When we take walks, I used to bring that, oh, look what God made. Look at the creation all around us. Look how awesome God made so grass, you know, can grow three inches just because you get six inches of rain after, you know, three months of no rain. You know, it's something to see how amazing God's creation is. And see how, you know, bring that in to your regular conversations. Make it normal, not forced. And in your marriage, instead of saying, I don't know what to do, say, you know, let's pray together. Let's work this out. Let's see what God's word says. Let's ask, you know, talk to the pastor. Let's, you know, see if we can get some Christian counseling. Make church non-negotiable. If you're a Christ-centered home, Christ -centered home you're, you go to church together as a family. You come together and worship and become a part of your local church community. And you just say, hey, we're going to church. You're going on Sunday, Sunday morning. You know, when our kids were little, we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, right? <laughs> and, and it got to be a bit much, I have to admit. And when we got here, our kids were complaining. I said, you guys only have to go once. The first... first Number four, son had to go three times a week. But it didn't kill him. He's still here. <laughs> we all survived. But, you know, but we go to church as a family. 
That's what family's about. Last Sunday, we got to go to a little church in Vermont. It was amazing. It was a little 1880, tall steeple thing, and it was a lot of fun. Very nice Wesleyan pastor there. Been only been there 20 years. He was a younger guy, and it was just fun to be there. See how, and then thirdly, show how seeking and receiving God is fun. When we're serving God, it can be a lot of fun. You know, don't just tell them the good news. Show it to them. Live it out with them. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Men and women of God, it's time to lead yourselves and your families. Lead toward a Christ-centered culture. Lead toward it. Here's the basics. Can you show it's a blessing to serve God? Can you show it's a blessing to serve God? Yes, it, yes, you can. Can you make church a priority? Yes, you can. Can you involve God in your conversations? Yes, you can. And I love what Joshua said very simply. He said this in Joshua 24, 15. He said, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Here it is. You choose today. Are you going to be a Christian home in name only, blending into the culture? Or are you going to be a Christ-centered home? Your choice. You lead. Are you going to thirst for hunger? Are you make the choice this day because blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what? They will be filled. Good. Will you be blessed? Will your family be blessed? Bless your home. Our worship team is coming up, and we're going to pray. And it's a fun song, and you'll enjoy it as we go out today. So why don't you stand with us as we pray, and these, these young guys get us ready for a last song today. Dear Father God, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus to be our example and our witness, and thank you for blessing us. Lord, a lot of us know our families aren't blessed all the time because we aren't always pursuing you. We wish we did. We know we fall short. And Lord, I know there are times, I, I know me and Gary blew up many times, and I wish I could go back and, and change all that. But Lord, you continue to bless and you continue to bring forward even those things that we've messed up on. Lord, help us today to choose to follow you and to put you first. May we be filled because we are pursuing you. In your name we pray, amen.